Hello, and thanks for checking out episode 15 of the Liberty Mastermind podcast. This is going to be an impromptu call-in interview uh, that Ox is going to do with Jake Robinson, and it's going to be retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, a lot by Amazon, a little bit about eBay, so how to put some money in your pocket, which might end up being life-changing and might have a huge effect on your liberty. Um, and before we plug in Ox's interview with Jake, uh, just be aware it's an impromptu call-in, so the audio is a little bit tin can, but I promise you if you stick around there, I was motivated by the end of it, and I just listened to the whole thing. So I promise you there's tons of actionable, real information here, and be sure to check out our article on the website, libertymastermindpodcast.com, for all sorts of links that we discussed in the show, and hope you come back for more. All right. Um, so let's get into let's get into some e-commerce stuff. So uh, you've got different things going on. You've got um, you've got private label, and then you've got sort of this other like webinar thing going on. Tell us about tell us about what you got going on. Okay. Um, back in 2015, sometime in January, I got an email. And I said, hey, make $100,000 a year selling physical products on Amazon without having to handle the, the inventory. I'm like, what? There's no way. That's BS. Because I've always thought, you know, yeah, eBay sounds kind of cool. I've heard people making money on eBay. But I could never sit around and go to my garage and box up five things and put labels on them and, you know, put the right postage on, take them to the post office and mail it and do that every freaking day for eBay. It's like, I would never, ever get into physical products like that. Yeah. Then, uh, but something about that email made me want to go look just to say, what the crap, you know, what is the catch? And what the guy explained explained was is that you know Amazon has this new program I don't know if it was new at the time it was fairly new called FBA fulfilled by Amazon and if you look at all the warehouses all over the United States that Amazon owns and you go into that warehouse I don't know if you've ever seen a video you got to bring it Google uh, you know Amazon robot warehouses or whatever you'll see some incredible stuff going on but it looks like do you know that scene from um Raiders of the Lost Ark, or the last scene where they put the box in the warehouse and then they zoom out and you start seeing how big that warehouse is. Yeah. It just keeps going and going. That's what that's what, uh, that's what an Amazon warehouse looks like, except it's a lot brighter, it's a lot prettier, and all the boxes are a lot smaller. <laughs> and okay. so it's huge is what I'm getting at. It's just freaking huge. Well, about 40% of the items that are in that uh, warehouse belong to individuals like you and me. Oh, wow. and we went out and we went somewhere and either purchased a bunch of stuff at Walmart on sale and turned around and sent it to, to Amazon. And so most people think everything Amazon sells is owned and bought by Amazon. It's not about 40% of everything they sell comes from third party sellers, which are individuals, entrepreneurs, small time, you know, mom and pop operations who are, are, are making money by putting items in, on their catalog and on, online. And of course, you know, Amazon's got 200 plus million credit cards on file. And when people show up there, they're ready to buy something. They're not just, you know, they've already gone to Google and done their research. So when they hit the Amazon, they're ready to purchase. Okay. And so there's different types of models that you can do on Amazon. You can do what's called a retail arbitrage or online arbitrage. And if I say retail arbitrage, I'm going I'm to see if you can, how close you can get to that. What does that make you think it might be? Well, that's what I, that term. Yeah, that's what I first thought you were going to go. Yeah, that's where I thought we were heading um, when you started talking about 40%. Um, so that's where, that's where I go to. It could be any, any, you know, uh, any store, and I buy something at a certain price, thinking that I can sell it on Amazon for a better price, for less than what I paid for it. Um, so that, that's my understanding of retail arbitrage. That's exactly right. 
exactly what it is. You, you show up to Walmart or Target or Big Lots or whatever, yeah. and you walk in with your smartphone, and you, and you don't just guess if you can. You pick up an item that's on sale, and it's selling for three bucks. Then you take the your scanner app, and you scan the barcode, and Amazon it pulls up and says, hey, this is selling for $22 on Amazon. And wow, okay, so if I can buy it for three, you're not going to get, uh, you know, you're not going to get 17 bucks or whatever the difference is. Amazon is going get, to get a part of that. In fact, they're going to get about 30% of that. So you take about 30% of a $22 price, and that's about $7. So now you're in it for 10 So if you can buy it, ship it to them, you got some shipping costs, maybe another dollar or two there. So if you're in it for 10 or 12 say 12 bucks, you sell it for 22 now you've made a $10 profit on that one item. Okay. And then if Walmart has 30 of them, you buy all 30 of them and send them, send them all in together in one big box. Amazon takes them and puts it in their warehouse, and then there's a listing for it. The listing's already on there if you're doing retail arbitrage. Somebody else is already selling that product. Hundreds of people have sold it. And so um, when somebody comes on Amazon and says, yeah, I want to buy that product, and you happen to be the one in the buy box, in other words, you've got the best price, and you've got pretty good service, and Amazon presents you as the one selling it, then they pick it, pack it, ship it, they take care of return, take care of customer service. Uh, they send you, they take care of collecting the money. You don't have to worry about, you know, credit card gateways and, and fraud and all that kind of stuff. They handle all of that. You just wind up getting your part of the, the take and they, you know, send you a check every now and then. And they do and that I, for 30, approximately 30% of what the item sells for? Yeah. Okay. Well, it could be more. I mean, it just depends. I mean, you might find an item that you're, you know, I find, I, uh, and I don't do retail overcharge, but I found some stuff that I should have done that with. Yeah. I, I bought a live scribe pen at Target. Oh, yeah. I don't know, you know what those things are. They're oh, like yeah. electronic audio recording pens that have a special paper. When you take written notes, take that pen and touch it to the paper, and it'll start playing back what you recorded audio wise. So if you're recording your, you know, your, professor giving a lecture you can go back and point to the word where you put a wrote down a word and listen right there where he started talking about that particular area so it's a cool ass pen anyway they cost about a hundred dollars or more and target was clearing them out man i think i bought them for like 15 bucks a pop no way. so in that case um, in that case i could have sent those in and i probably would have made these probably made 70 bucks profit per wow now, there's a lot of people that do RA, retail arbitrage. OA, online arbitrage, is when people don't even go to the store. They sit there in their underwear and they go on to Walmart online and they find something on sale there and they order it online and get it shipped to them and they turn around and ship it back out to, uh, to, to, uh, to Amazon. And that's, that's just a different version of it. Uh, sometimes it can, can be a little trickier. But at the end of the day, you're, you're just kind of like a, a guy trying to sell stuff at a flea market. I don't like RA and OA because every day you got to still go back out and find some new items. I mean, 30 items can sell in a couple of days on Amazon. Right. And then you got to go back out and find some more items to sell. And it's always a different item. And then plus, I think you got to know too much. These people who sell toys, oh my gosh, that's why. Could you imagine if you, if that if you're going to be an expert in uh, say baseball cards, you got to know all of the players and all the stats and which card is is hot and which card's not and, and how much it cards worth. You got to do the same thing with toys. People who arbitrage toys, they got to know every Disney movie and every character and what edition it was and what movie it was and whether it's a sequel or not. You got to know what's coming up on the horizon because there's a new movie coming out that's a sequel. Now the old stuff is starting to sell again because the new, new movie's coming out. I mean, it's just so convoluted. It's like, that makes my head hurt. Right. That sounds like a full time job. And, and it most, is a full time job. Most, most of us are just looking for a side that's hustle. A night, that's a nightmare that I do dreamed eBay would be. Uh, yeah. The only thing about it is if you find a bunch of stuff and you send it in, you at least don't have to pack it and ship it and, and do each single one. Now, the holy, you know, you can do um, wholesale where you can try to find a wholesale a company that will wholesale your product, but your margins are not going to be very good because you're, 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 you're sourcing from the U.S. and there's just too, there's a lot of overhead. The holy grail is private label. Okay. And that's where you go and, and find, you know, a 
French coffee press that you like, and you go to China and you get it sourced from the manufacturer, and you get it dirt, dirt cheap, and you can get get a thousand units or five thousand units, and you do your proper research and figure out if you can get on the Amazon and sell it at a profit, and and and, and people will buy it. But then once you've done all that research and you've shipped your products in, then it's like, okay, I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs because I've got a thousand of them to sell. <laughs> and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And, uh, oh, I'm starting to sell through. It looks like I need to go ahead and call a factory because by the time I put my order in and they ship me my next load, I'm going to come close to running out. And I want to, you know, fill it back up again. And so really private label you can let you buy back your time in the real world and have a real business and make some serious money without having to, you know, be going out, traipsing around all over town trying to get a Walmart deal. Yeah, that. so the, the, the retail arbitrage or maybe even online arbitrage, in my mind, I mean, I don't know very much, but it just seems like it's more of a side hustle thing. Like you might have an extra hour or two in the day yeah. where you might go – go down the street and check out. I'll give you an example. One guy I work with, he's a therapist. Um, you know, we both see the same patients, but I, I see them for medical management. He sees them for therapy. Sometimes the patients, you know, they bail or they don't show up. So he's got an hour gap in his schedule where, you know, the he's not seeing anybody. So he could either, like, piddle around on Facebook or whatever. But what he does is he goes to... Um, the thrift stores and he hits up the thrift stores and he uses the eBay app where, you know, he's, he's, he's looking at, uh, you know, he's scanning this brand new polo shirt or whatever and he's seeing, the same thing yeah, he's on, on eBay, on, on the thing eBay. eBay is you can actually get bigger margins cause you can find, I mean, Amazon's really particular about the, the condition your product's in yeah. and you certainly can't sell something new that's not new but on eBay you know everybody knows that there's going to be a range of conditions and you can go to a thrift store and find something like a VCR yeah nobody wants VCRs but guess what they pay 80 to 100 120 bucks for them every day because now they don't have a VCR and we find some VHS tapes of so, oh crap that's some old vacation movies and I don't have a way to play it right. I think I'm going to go buy a used VCR yeah. So, yeah, there, there's high margins in uh, that stuff, and it does work. However, I did have a guy that I interviewed on my webinars that was an engineer by, tr by day, 40-hour week, and he worked 20 hours part-time doing retail arbitrage, and he made an extra $120,000 a year what? like clockwork. By going to local, like, Lowe's or Home Depot's Target? Well, or? he probably had a system now. He probably figured out that there were certain places he could go. There were probably certain items that kept coming back in the stock yeah. that he could go make a deal with a manager. He got good at online arbitrage. Okay. So, you know, he, he's figured it out. And, he's, and you have to. you got to figure out. There's got you got to figure that stuff out. He figured it out. And in fact, he got good enough that he started selling some of the information that he was using, saying, hey, you can pay me $50 a month, and I'm going to give you a list every Monday of all these great items that have great return on investments, and you can either their online arbitrage or here's, you know, retail arbitrage. But keep in mind, you're not the only one doing it. Right. I guarantee you that all the targets across the U.S. were all marking down those pins and clearing them out. And there were other people like me, and I was buying them for my own use. Uh, but if I, 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 I didn't even know about them. Amazon back then, but I guarantee you that the people who do, we're all buying them. So everybody, there's you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of people doing that across the U.S. that are buying that same great deal, and they're all sending the products into Amazon. So now you're competing with a bunch of other people for that same product, and it's a dogfight at that point. And they call it the race to the bottom because maybe <laughs> the price starts up there, at, you know, eighty bucks because it sells for a hundred on a store. Maybe you're selling for eighty-five or ninety, or maybe you started selling for a hundred, and then somebody else comes in and says, well, I'll drop it to 95 because I only paid $15 for it. And then there you go. They start dropping their price, fighting with each other, and it's the race to the bottom until there's, like, no margin. And you're like, oh, crap, I can't even sell my product now. There's so many I'm on, on that listing. So there are some drawbacks to it, and you do have to figure that part out. I will say this. If somebody's brand new to it, 
private label is a little, little bit more daunting on the front end because there's a lot more, um, you know, it's just a lot more brain power that has to go into it to figure out, am I making a good investment? Because if you buy a bunch of stuff from overseas and get it shipped here, and you know, you had, and you really didn't find a way to test it, you can wind up sitting on a bunch of product that you can't get rid of. But on the other hand, once you once you do do that. That, that plan you you've got uh you know it's downhill from there but to learn the amazon platform and just to get your feet wet and maybe build up some capital doing retail arbitrage is not a bad idea i mean you can mm-hmm. you can learn how to you know set up a listing and learn how to you know how to how do you actually send product into amazon and what are the requirements for shipping and what are the weights and where do you send it and all that kind of stuff by the way amazon has a killer deal with uh, all the shippers so when you ship your stuff to amazon you're using Amazon shipping account and it's dirt cheap. And I sent a 43 pound box of stuff to California for, you know, $18 or something like that. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, so they're giving deep, deep discounts to people like us to send our stuff in, which can, take, you know, cause it to make it to be uh, financially worthwhile to do it. When, when you're sending it to a customer or when you're sending it to them to fulfill? No, when you send it to Okay. Like I said, that, that box was a box of, of um, I had 16 items in a box that I would send to uh, Amazon each time I wanted to refill, uh, uh, replenish my, my inventory. And that one box would weigh 43 pounds, and that's why I know that. Uh, that 43-pound box, uh, I can, uh, it depends on where they want me to send it. You know, Amazon had some weird uh, computer uh Algorithms always going on, and so when you go and put your listing uh, or, or, or open a new shipment uh, order and say, "Hey, I'm about to replenish my stock," they get all your information. They say, "Okay, we want you to send it to this warehouse in California." Well, crap, I'm in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and there's one, there's a, a warehouse in my town. Like, why can't I just drive over there in my car and just unload it on the dock for you, man? That would save me some money. And that, no, that's not how they operate. They want it there in California. And then what's really weird is, is there might, there's 16 items in that box. They may ship five, out, five of them over to Kansas City warehouse on their own through their back channel shipping. What? It did that all the time. I don't know how they make any money, to tell you the truth, but they move stuff around. And generally the reason why is that if somebody wants to buy my item, and uh, they've all they've got them all in California, and somebody in Tennessee wants to order one. Well, it's kind of inconvenient to ship it all across the country, so they want to try to get your inventory spread out. Of course, I'm not probably the only person selling this private label product. Let's say it's a, a French coffee press. There's a bunch of other people selling French coffee presses, which are similar to mine, but not exact. But they spread them out all over the place, try to keep their, their inventory so that when at any given time somebody orders a French coffee press, um, you know, they've got one that's that's fairly close to them so that they can ship it to their customer and get there quick. Yeah. That's fascinating. I never knew that they uh, sort of had these back channels and moving stuff around. Yeah, man, it's weird, but they do that all the time. Uh, or sometimes if, you, if you've if you got a bunch of pro- loose products that you're sending in, they say send five of them to California, send three of them to Kansas City, and send six of them up here to Philadelphia. So you had to wind up doing three different shipments, which is a little bit more pain in the butt. But um, there's ways around that. Uh, the, the, the little trick there is, is that you you case pack your items in a case, and so therefore they say, oh, man, we can't split that up. It's a case, and so they send the case to one place. So, so uh, let me, let's go back for a sec. So I mentioned the uh, the coworker who, um, yeah. you know, he, he might get an hour or two or maybe at lunch, you know, maybe yeah. a patient doesn't show, so he's got an hour block or two hours, something like that. Um you know, I've gone with him sometimes to these thrift stores and, and he'll whip out his phone. He's got this eBay app and, you yeah. know, you scan these barcodes and then you can sort the results by what items have sold that have that barcode. Yeah, completed, completed sales. Yeah. And so, so you mentioned, Am- but we're talking mainly about Amazon. Is the, does Amazon have an app that will show yeah. what has sold? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, 
that's what you want to sell them for. Oh, okay. At any given time. Now, there are other apps you can use, like there's an app, Keepa, and there's an app called Camo, Camo, Camo. They're both free. And you can put in the ASIN number, which that's, that's Amazon's ID number for a product. ACIN, ASIN, and you put that ASIN number in there, and it'll actually give you the history of the, of the product. Like it, it, it was selling for fifteen dollars, and then it shows you a bar chart, oh, a line chart. Okay, and it goes across, and then all goes up to twenty-two dollars, and then it goes down, and you know, three weeks later, it drops down to seventeen dollars, and you can see the whole history of that item and, and what it's been selling for. And uh, you know, you can see if it's seasonal or not. If it's seasonal, and it goes out of fact and it drops down to where it's not you can also see what you know maybe what the volume is so yeah there's there's always there's software for everything there's an app for that oh, t- tell me the name of those apps again camel what was it camel 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 so camel uh, like uh, the animal camel yep okay and what was and the first one k-e-e-t-a some of them are websites you go to some of them are like chrome browser plugins that okay. you can just Click on and open stuff. We'll put those you in the can do your smartphone too. That's cool. Um, so maybe let, we'll loop back around to the private label. But what you know, more, I think more folks than not are going to be that you know. Hey, I have an extra one or two hours per day. Um, you know, or or maybe yeah. at lunchtime I want to make a couple bucks or something like that. You know, what yeah. can what can someone do if they've got an extra one to say three hours a day. I can do a lot. I mean, how much money do you want to invest? Mm-hmm. You didn't have to buy the product, but okay. you know, I don't know. I, I've always liked going to yard sales and flea markets. I always liked the idea of getting, you know, clearance items and, and getting deals, but mainly just because I enjoy doing it for myself. But if you've got the time to do that, you do like this guy. You have a couple places you want to go. You go to Walmart, you go to the clearance aisle, you go to uh, Home Depot and go to the clearance aisle or whatever, and you take your phone and you start scanning. Oh, in 10 or 15 minutes, you should be able to find several products that, you know, maybe one or two that meet the criteria. Then you have to decide whether you're going to pull the trigger or buy it. Okay. And that's where the rubber meets the road. So if they've got, you know, 40 of them sitting on a shelf and they're, you know, their sell price is seven dollars. Well, okay, that's two hundred and ten dollars or something like that. Are you going to pull the trigger and buy them all and put them in a the basket, and take them home, and then then, you, and then it's on you to you know at least box them up and, and send them into uh, to uh, Amazon. So that's part of the you know the, the lag the lag time. You got to spend time. Um, you got to go you know get on the listing and put your put your listing make your order to ship to them and you got to get it packed up and you got to make sure that your weight's right because you can't ship more than 50 50 pounds to amazon and if it's more than that there's special instructions and that kind of thing so wow. you got to keep keep that in mind so you might find out that 40 items might come out to 150 pounds well that means you're gonna have to ship about three boxes worth of it to them it's a, yeah, you, but you get a lot done. But if you if you do that, you think about it. It, it wouldn't. You could do that in an hour. You could go spend fifteen or twenty minutes in a, in a store and and identify a winner. Mm-hmm. And then if you got the confidence to pull the trigger, just go ahead and buy what they've got, or buy you know maybe they got a hundred of them. Maybe you buy fifteen or twenty or ten and send them in and see if they're selling, it and go back and get the rest if they still have them. Okay. So yeah, it's you can definitely. Uh, get that done in an hour or two. Um, I mean, I, I interviewed a lady that had a lot of kids, and she well, she had to go out sourcing. She had to take her kids with them, and they were young, and she's busy and, you know, juggling, but she still got the job done. She still, she still made a lot of money doing it. I mean, there are a lot of people making six figures just doing retail arbitrage. So are these folks, that that's, <laughs> that's pretty good money. Are these folks, I mean, is it better, is it better to like try to hit up the garage sales or thrift stores or the big giants that we typically think about, like the targets and the, you know what the permaculture answer that is, right? It depends. It depends, man. It really depends on where your head's at. You know, do you have any knowledge of going to, um, garage sales? You know, and 
again, just going back to what's your knowledge of the item. If I come, if I'm a, uh, this guy's a, what did you say, was a dental guy? What, what was he, this guy? Uh, oh, my, uh, he's a therapist. A therapist, like what kind of therapist? Like physical therapist? Uh, he does addiction therapy, like counseling. Okay. All right. Well, let's just say it's a, you know, somebody that in the medical field, they show up at a garage sale, and some guy has a stethoscope there. Mm -hmm. Well, a nurse or a doctor would know how much a stethoscope costs and, how, and whether it's a good, you know, brand or not. So them knowing that, and the person that's selling is like, yeah, this is some stuff my son had, and he went from school, and he never came back and got it, we're selling it. I, I'll spend my mom five bucks. For the stethoscope, but it's you know what kind of stethoscope is it? If a person said, "Damn, this is a two hundred dollars stethoscope," Scott, I'll get it for five bucks. Yeah, I'm gonna get it. If you have a knowledge of tools, you know, but tools are heavy, so you have to consider that when you're shipping something. Uh, but if you know games, you know board games. Board games are you know if they're all if all the pieces are there. If you have all the pieces, a Scrabble game, it's an over Scrabble game, or. Battleship or whatever, you know, those board game Monopoly or whatever it might be, those things are hot sellers. Legos, um, uh, you know, a set of Legos that are all together. So it's whether you have a knowledge of that stuff. you got to have a, a little bit of knowledge. You know, a lot of people sell books. So books is a big entry for a lot of people on Amazon. That's where Amazon got their start. Yeah. And I talked to, I just got back from a conference with Amazon sellers and a lot of them started out with books. But they would always, I found that the, the similar theme was they all seem to be migrating away from books as soon as possible. I guess it's a pain in the butt. Are the margins? But they go to like Goodwill stores and go to the book aisle and they mm -hmm. got their scanner out. Beep, beep, they're scanning every single book and then, uh, you know, they look at the book and the price and look at what they can sell it for and they throw it in their cart. And so there's, there's all, all types of niches within the niche, all types of niches within Amazon mm -hmm. or e-commerce that you can figure out that you're good at. So uh, I think that going to yard sales, unless you're a yard sale person anyway and you already know about what things should cost and what seems like a good deal or not, I mean, I know when I walk up at a yard sale, you got something priced on it. My gut instinct tells me, oh, that's a great price. Or my gut instinct says, man, that guy's never going to sell that. I would never pay that for that. I use that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's too, the price is too, I have a better instinct on those things, partly because they got better a lot, but partly because I think everybody does have a built-in meter when they know something is like outrageously priced or, or super duper, you know, killer deal. But it's a lot easier to go, I think, going into a retail store because you're buying a brand new item, you can scan it, you can look on Amazon right there on the spot and look at the exact item and compare apples to apples and say, I can buy it for this. With the market, I mean, they got a calculator that tells you what all your Amazon fees are, et cetera. It tells you exactly what your rate, of, you know, your net profit is on that item if you sell it for the price it's listed. Oh, wow. Using the Amazon app? So we say? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, there, and there's a lot of aftermarket apps that other companies have come up with that they say this is better or faster. It has more features than Amazon's app. And it includes some data that maybe Amazon doesn't. So, you know, it's, it's an industry. And, um, and going back to the webinars, which that's kind of how I learned a lot, a lot of this stuff. Back in 2015 in January when I saw this email, I started reading up, going to blogs and finding stuff on YouTube and I was just hungry for information. There was a bunch of Facebook groups about private label. Uh, I joined them and I started asking questions, reading the posts, seeing the interactions, seeing what's going on. Well, I, I own uh, a copy of a piece of a, of a software called Webinar Jam. It's a webinar software and I bought it when it first came out. I pay like a one price for lifetime, so I never have to upgrade, update it or, or pay for upgrades. And so I got this professional webinar software, and I'm sitting there thinking, huh, hey, would anybody like to jump on a live webinar and just have like a round live discussion about private label? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like six or eight or nine of us got on there, and we just sit there and talk to each other like we're sitting around talking now. And what are you doing? How are you going to do this? How do you do this? What's the best way to do that? I'm thinking about doing it this. What do you think about that? After a couple of those, I was like, you know, maybe we need to get somebody in here that knows more than us. Because we didn't really know a lot. So <laughs> I looked for a guy in the Facebook room that I knew was answering a lot of questions, seemed like they were successful, and said, hey, would you?
want you to do an interview, and I interviewed the guy, and he knew a lot of stuff. I'm like, wow, that's great. So then I just started going out looking for people I could interview. So every, it turned into a thing, like every week, I was interviewing some major seller that was doing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, or millions of dollars a year. It started blowing my mind. And I've got this front row seat where it's my own private you know, private label class on how to do private label with the best sellers out there. And I get to ask any question I want. I'm a, I'm a question guy anyway. Yeah, I was gonna, we before we got on the before we got on the call, we were you know we were, we were both chuckling about. I think both of our superpowers is is asking questions. You know, I get paid. It's definitely my superpower. What was that? It's definitely my superpower. I, I ask questions with the force of a crossing a journey. <laughs> Uh, 
up to eleven thousand dollars a day depending on your sales. But they'll they, they look at your account, what you're selling, and they make you whole so that you don't lose an income while you're trying to figure out how to get unspending, which may take you know, could take a couple of months. Wow. A couple of weeks. What's That's the a company service? Huh? What's the suspension insurance company? You know, I can't remember the name of it. They were at the the event this 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 past week. Okay. Um well, if you remember, yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. That's amazing. Um, so you, but, yeah, it's only kind of another that does it, and they also sell liability and um, uh, liability insurance on your product. So if you, like, one lady bought a product from uh, China, it was some kind of, uh, oh, I forget now, some kind of, uh, it had it had some like cutting tool on it. Oh, you cut watermelons with it. It was a, it was a device you used to cut watermelons into cubes. And she was pressing that on the handle, broke and cut the very tip of her finger off. Just like oh. a very, you know, the, really the, the tip of her. And she sued Amazon, sued the manufacturer, and the manufacturer is guess who? You, because if you're sourcing something straight from China, you are now sued the manufacturer. She sued them, sued Amazon, sued I don't know, sued everybody in line. And uh, so if you don't have liability insurance, that, you know, that's rare. It's very rare that something like that's going to happen. You just have to be prepared for something like that. You know, what's the worst that can or can happen? And they have insurance for that as well. So now what I'm looking at is people are starting to use Shopify for e-commerce, which is a platform, it's an online store where you can sell your own stuff. And a lot of people that are, have been, become successful on Amazon are starting to move some of their stuff over to Shopify so they have a separate channel so people can buy them directly from them while they're still buying, you know, selling stuff on Amazon. That way if Amazon shuts them down, they've got a second uh, stream of income over here and they can really ramp that up. So people sell on Pinterest and Etsy and people are now starting to sell on Facebook and using Facebook advertising and video is really hot right now. So my webinars are going to expand Whereas mm -hmm. I almost never talked about RA and OA, I think I'm going to start, I'm probably going to feature like a, make each, each webinar, I'll feature maybe like a 10 minute spotlight on retail arbitrage and just do like a quick 10 minute interview with somebody in the room that, that is in RA or OA, just so I can address that area. Uh, Amazon merch is a big hot thing right now. Oh yeah, um, I applied to... Uh for Amazon merch. I still haven't heard back from them. I hear it's like How a two or three months. Hmm? How long ago did you apply? Uh, at least a month or a month and a half, maybe at least. Yeah, it took me that long to get approved. I, I think it was like a month and a half, maybe two months. It's, there's really no reason, rhyme or reason why it takes that long, but it does. Everybody says it takes a pretty good long a bit of time to get approved. So I thought this would, they weren't approving me. Okay, I'm just not getting approved. But then all of a sudden it showed up in the, the uh, it showed up in, in my email uh, right before I went to this conference after I went down to, to Texas to help, you know, the hurricane survivors. And I was thinking, you know, while I was down there the whole time, I was like, man, a cool idea, the cool idea for sure would, would be, hey, we're all Texans now. Right. You know, we're all Texans because we're here helping, the, helping these guys, people coming in from all over the U.S. to help. And so I thought that would be a great shirt. So I whipped up this real quick. I got my merch done. Yeah, you know, I, I got to go to this conference. I whipped up this shirt. Uh, I used Word of all things. And whipped up a shirt. Basically, just said I uh, found a you know an icon or an emblem of the, of the state of Texas and put that on there. And I put We're all Texans now. And I put Pound Harvey 2017. Um, I thought, yeah, I might sell a few shirts while I'm going to this conference. I get back and find this email that says uh, if you do this again, we're gonna um, we're gonna close your account because you violated paragraph 2.5 of exploiting human tragedy. You're like, what? <laughs> so, um, I'm laughing to you guys out there. If you're going to join, if you're going to get approved to merge, don't just go out and rush out and make a t-shirt. You need to read the POS, Terms of Service, and you need to watch the tutorials. And when I was at this conference, the top merch guy, Chris Green, was talking about merch from the stage. And that's what he said, by the way, guys, don't do something stupid like, you know, do, make a shirt about a hurricane Harley because you'll get you'll get your account closed. <laughs> I'm like, oh crap, I just did that. 
<laughs> but thank goodness they warned me. They didn't close my account. They said, don't do it again. But, you know, I've already got a black mark against me. So uh, that's how fickle Amazon is. I'm thinking, look, I, I work for a nonprofit that gives money and food and water to victims. I was honoring the victims. I wasn't exploiting them. I was, in fact, I was going to take all the money that I raised for that T-shirt and, and donate it to Citizens Assisting Citizens, the, the, the nonprofit that I'm, I'm on the board for. So uh, it just backfired on me. So. Well, one thing, yeah, it's good to remember. One thing that I was just thinking, uh, you know, aside from where someone may fall on the for it or against it, whatever, but you know, the whole take a knee, take a knee, don't take a knee, all that's all that's a big, big hot topic right now. And yeah, I thought about just doing a shirt that said "Stand Up" with an exclamation point, or because that dude that came out of the tunnel. Uh, team. I missed that. Okay, there's, there's one guy with it. There's all the, the Steelers had agreed that everybody's going to stay in the tunnel until after the anthem, so they wouldn't even have to deal with the, the choice. Okay. But one of the guys on the team was like a two, uh, a two-term Afghan. Oh, the uh, uh, Ranger. Yeah, and, and he said, you know, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to honor the flag, so he just kind of stepped up just beyond the shadows of the tunnel and put his hand over his heart. Well, there was a bunch of press watching that, and they all got it on camera, and all of a sudden, his jersey became like the hottest selling NFL jersey, like overnight, bam, 100,000 jerseys sold. Yeah. And what I was wanting to do was take his number and the team colors. They wouldn't say Steelers, so I wouldn't be violating the IP or, you know, uh, intellectual property, I would just put his his number with the whatever color of the jersey, white background, yellow letters, and just over the number say stand up with an exclamation point. And I thought that would be a, a hot seller. But you never know. They, they might consider that political. You know, I don't know what the, what the deal is on that. I got to go read my terms of service and watch the tutorials before I do anything else. <laughs> well, but stand up or take a knee or. Hot. Yeah, so anyway, I'm going to cover all those topics in my webinars. And then one of the things I'll probably do as well is they had several vendors at this event that had really kick butt uh, services or software tools or like the insurance. They had an attorney there that represents sellers and, and uh, in, the, in the event that there's like, you know, somebody wants to restrict you from selling your item because they've got a patent infringement. Well, you know, sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. Bottom line is there's a lot of software and services available to third-party sellers, and I plan to probably do like once a month, I'll review one of those products or services. Let them come on the show, and we'll do a demo, and, you know, I'll be asking for a discount for the listener, for, for, for our audience. And then, of course, I'll be an affiliate for it because I don't hate money. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's the least I can do is get paid a little bit to do the show. Because I did the sh when I did it the first time, I just totally did it for free. I just did it for fun of it. But it turned into something, you know, 3,000 people. My YouTube videos get anywhere from five to 10,000 views. Once they hit, I'm not, uh, I, I, I wasn't capturing those email addresses from those viewers. It was all just, okay, you're getting a little, you know. Nope, I never charge anybody to watch it anyway, and I still won't charge to, to watch the webinars. But I do want to figure out how to capture more people so I could, I mean, if I, if I have 300 or 400 people come to my webinar and they maybe see the replay, and another four or 5,000 see it on YouTube, unless they figure out how to get to my email list, they might not ever see the next video that I put out there. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be a service to them if I capture their email and let them know, hey, next week we got this guy or this gal coming up. Well, and I've had some really powerhouse folks on there. The uh, a lot of the folks that I listen to and look to, you know, because I'm, I'm new, business isn't my background. You know, I'm I'm in healthcare, I'm in uh, psychiatry right now, and you know, I'm getting into the e-commerce and and learning about it and and that sort of thing. But everybody that I look to talks about how important the email list is. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. like it's, they talk about it like it's gold. Um, it is gold. Um, yeah. You know, that, and 
and I let my gold get dusty. I mean, uh, a fresh email list is gold, but if you have an email list of 3,000 people and you sit on it for a year, you don't send anything. If, you know, they disappear, they, you know, of course, all those people have already changed interest, they lost interest, they got started, they didn't like it, and they moved on. But I did send an email out before I went to the conference saying, hey, guys, remember me, I remember this, well, I'm going to reboot this, I'm going to relaunch, so stay That's tuned, awesome. but here's what I plan on doing, tell me what you think, and what would you like to see, and I had a lot of people respond, and I've had a lot of people be, would, would email me, or or send me a Facebook message, or they'd see me post online and, and said, by the way, man, when are you going to start those webinars again? It was the greatest things ever. Oh, wow. And it really encouraged me, because I, I, I don't think I'm, you know, I'm not a pro. I just enjoy asking people questions. I enjoy digging in and getting the answers and getting the story. And I, I dig having a good time and having, you know, throwing some humor in there. It ain't no stuffy... Um, interview yeah. and uh, I don't let them get away with it either I'll dig in and drill down and, and find out what that because nothing bugs me more than me watching somebody interview somebody that's an expert and they just ask the surface level questions and I'm like well wait a minute what's the follow up there's a big follow up man it's right there in front of you don't, don't you see what the follow up question is you need to ask him how did he do that because I don't want to know how yeah. they don't do it and so um my interviews tend to go about two hours long, so I get every bit of them, every drop out of them. <laughs> they need a cigarette after they're uh, after they're done talking with you. Are you? Yeah, they say, well, what happened? Did I just build a bit? Did I just give up my proprietary <laughs> secrets that I've never told anybody else? That's awesome. Yeah, you sure did. We got them now, buddy. Too late. You can't get them back. It's out there for the, the world. The whole world can find out. So I'm guessing. So are you wanting to do the? Um, well, this, all of this as a part-time or full-time thing? No, nah, it's a full-time gig for me. I mean, okay. I've been piddling around for the last several years just trying to figure out what I want to do. And I, when, I, when I started doing that, that was kind of just part-time. And, and it was, you know, it was organic. It just happened. I mean, if I said, okay, I'm going to do something like a build a list of 3,000 people, I would have never been able to figure out how to do it. This just happened. It just by, you know, organic nature, the timing was right. FBA, private label, was a cool, um, hot trend like merch is right now. Yeah. And, and I just got in front of that wave and got lucky and caught a wave and surfed it. But I just didn't stay on it, you know, situation changed. But I'm also a little more savvier now, so I also see that there's a lot more other opportunities to, and I think that my, the webinar thing in and of itself, even if I never sold another product on private label or if I never sold R8, I, I think I could make a living just doing that because there is a lot of information. There's a lot of money for people who curate information, and I'm a curator. I'm, I'm drawing out information that you want to know about, and I'm putting it where you can go consume it and learn from it and without having to join a $5,000 course out there. And there are several of them that you pay five, six thousand. You want, you want to go to China and learn how to source uh, straight to the manufacturer? Well, there's a guy that does it. He charges six thousand dollars to take you over, and that doesn't include airfare and hotel and food. That's just to do his deal. Now he'll hook you up with a, a translator that. Uh, you walk around with all day long. Mm. They'll take you to Ewu, where there's 80,000 booths from different manufacturers in China, and put you up in a hotel. And you guys, every morning you'll have, um, you know, uh, you'll you'll do, it, or every night you do. Uh, they actually put you in a conference room and and teach you, you know, what you need to be doing. And you walk out of there with purchase orders with, with products that you source directly from the manufacturer. So, but it's expensive. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be interviewing a guy that does that. I met a guy at the conference that, that he does that. He goes, well, you know, if you want to go to China, Jake, I wouldn't charge six thousand. You can just go with me. I said, okay. Oh, I'm up for that. Wow. Uh, so I'll be interviewing his his head and stepping out his brain. Hey, let me know if you need, uh, you know, medical backup. I'll uh, I'll be happy to go with you guys. <laughs> Yeah, might be so. How did you... Yeah, weird food over there. <laughs> Lots of... Uh, how did you build up the list? How did you incentivize people to get on your email list when you first started to build it up okay. to 3,200? When I first did it, it was 
really clunky. I didn't have an email service, so like, what I would do is, um, I have Webinar Jam. A Webinar Jam will capture your email, your name and your email. So if I create a webinar and it gives me a link that I can go post on a website or post in a Facebook group, when I post that link, it has a little, you know, logo that pops up and it has the name of the episode and who's going to be on it. And then I put some description in the, in the actual uh, post. And then when they click on that, it gets, takes them to a landing page that's, that's generated by Webinar Jam. And the landing page says, hey, you know, Webinar has got a countdown clock saying that the webinar's going to start in, you know, 26 hours and 13 minutes and all that kind of stuff. And it's got the, uh, I, use, I put an image of the, the speaker on there and, and the title of the webinar, something that, a headline that kind of grabs them, like how Michael Quinn went from zero to $3.8 million in sales in less than a year and why he's not using Alibaba anymore or whatever. And so it's, you know, it's like any other webinar. You look at it, oh, okay, so I want to watch this. So reserve your seat, click here. They click on it, put your name and the email address. Well, the email address just got uh, saved into a file. And so when I got ready to, to send out the next, now that they've already attended one webinar, I've got their email address, I was going into Gmail and just basically doing a cut and paste into blind carbon copy of you know 300 emails that I've collected so far. So I'd send out an email of 300 people that, uh, have already been to one of my webinars, so they could go straight to the link and, and register. And then I would make another, you know, create another webinar and go around and post to a bunch of Facebook groups and get a bunch of new people. And then I got to the point where I had more than 500 people and then Gmail, so you can't send more than 500 people in one email. So then I had about <laughs> a thousand people. I was having to like send like two different emails, one with 500 and one with 480. And I sent out two different emails, and that kind of got. And then eventually, I said, "Wait, this is stupid. I just need to. I, I need to get one of those companies like Aweber. Mm -hmm. I got Get Response. Get Response. I use, I use Get Response because they would let me import my email list. A lot of them won't. If you have like a raw email list, like just your collection of emails, well, according to Aweber, they haven't really opted in. You know, officially, you know, double opt in that kind of thing. Yeah. G uh, Get Response was the only one that would let me import a bunch of emails. I think at the time I did that, I might have had, uh, I probably had around 1,000 or 1,500 emails. And um, and so they, they didn't require me to go to this third party company that they would take all your emails and look at them and then they would get rid of any that would be considered spam or suspect emails. I mean, there's some of them were. And, and cleaned up my list. I think I went from like, Maybe 1,200 down to about 1,100. I lost about 100 emails out of that. But that's a small price to pay to actually get in, you know, a, a, a bona fide email company. So that when you send out a bunch of emails at one time like that, those, if I send out 500 emails, blind carbon copy, and there's a bunch of people that have AOL email addresses, some of them have Yahoo or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yahoo sees all those emails come in at the same time. They go, well, wait a minute, this has got to be spam. And a lot of times it gets caught in their spam trap, and you never make it to the person's inbox. And that's the value of hiring a company like AWeber or Eye Contact or Get Response or MailChimp is that they maintain a you know clean list, and then when, when any of those other email clients out there see uh, an email coming from one of these big companies, they uh, they know that they're not being spammed, so they allow that email to come on through. Okay. So, you know, just because you have 3,000 emails doesn't mean you're getting 100% you know, reach. Uh, you want to get as much as possible. What is uh, What does get response cost per month? Uh, it's about $45 a month. Okay. Does it and let you, does it kind of let you know, like, the percent of, of people that open emails okay, and yeah, click? They when they open it, who open it, when they open it, uh, oh, okay. whether they clicked in on your link or not. I mean, I give you all those stats. Oh, cool. Fact, they've got something that's called smart delivery, where if you have the same email list and you've sent it a couple times, it knows, get response, checks all of the stats and says, you know, this guy generally will oh, it has a better chance of opening your email if it arrives at 7 p.m. his time. So you do this 
smart time release thing that they do. And so you send it out to your whole list, and then over a 24-hour period, X number get delivered on this hour, they push another, and they know uh, what hour is best to send those things out. Of course, some of them are across, you know, they're not just in the U.S., they're around the world. And those delivery times, you know, if you deliver an email at, six, at 3 o'clock in the morning, and most people are checking their email at 7 or 8 in the morning, they might see it, it might be stacked behind a bunch of other emails, but if it comes in right when they're, you know, when they're usually active, there's a better chance you're going to open your emails. There's a lot of science behind that, and Get Response has done a lot of research to, to figure that stuff out. That's pretty you know, fascinating. Yeah, so it, to me, it was, it was an accident that I kept doing that. It's just that, that the Webinar Jam software did me a big favor. I didn't even realize it. I said, oh, wait a minute, Webinar Jam is collecting these emails. I can send these guys a, a notice the next time I do one. And I realized, wow, there's they're just collecting, uh, it's been on an email list for me. I was kind of excited at that point. After I had several hundred, I didn't really realize it. And so I just started uh, leveraging it. And now I think I can go 10x with my email list because I've had thousands and thousands of views on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So my web, the webinar reports, the, the live webinar reports it, it pushes it to YouTube. But once it's on YouTube, Anybody can, you know, search my keywords and find FBA, private label, Amazon Hangout, whatever, and watch it. Mm-hmm. What I want to do now is figure out a way that, okay, when you come to my YouTube, there's a link in the description. Maybe there's a hot link in the video itself that says, hey, if you like this video, click here and we'll add you to our list. And so you can be notified of future or maybe gate it. Some, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I feel about that. But like an opt-in? A, like a, uh, what do they call it, a lead magnet where you give something consumable to no, get? Well, what I give them is they start watching the video and then 15 minutes into it, I will box box up and say, hey, if you, want to, if you want to finish watching the video, put your name and, and email in and we'll notify you of future uh, things. It doesn't cost you anything, but if they want to finish watching that particular webinar, they'd have to enter it. So that's, that would be like a gate. You know, if you want to pass through the gate, you got to give me your name and an email address. Now, I don't know if I'm going to do that because I think some people would just tick them off, you know? Yeah. Well, so I don't know about that. I've got to talk some, to some experts that know more, more than me about, hey, how do I capture these emails? And maybe, look, uh, don't tick them off. Just put the link in the YouTube, put the link in the description, and you're going to get a big enough a number of them that you're not going to be uh, miffed about it. And so that's what I'm hoping. Or, or uh, what they call, I guess, split testing it. I don't know if you can uh, you could do that in YouTube, but sort of split test different ideas. One, I could, I could probably, yeah, I could probably do it with two different webinars that have similar you know views. Yeah, and uh, and, and and just see. And I don't know if I can do a split a true split test. It would be cool if I could, where you know every other person that shows up, the gate pops up, and every other person when the gate doesn't pop up, they get um, a link in the video. I don't know if I could do that. I just don't know if that would work. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how it would work, but I don't quite know enough about YouTube. But I, I have heard of other of folks doing. You know, they always talk about split testing different ideas. You know, try option A and try yeah. option B and see which one works better. Um, yeah, there's something called multivariate testing, which is even it's split testing on steroids, where they've got software out there that if you got a website. And you've got like an article on the page, you've got an image, so let's say it's a blog post, and you've got links on the side that they can join your list and they can whatever. You can go in and have this thing change it where it substitutes a different image, you know, a man or a woman or a man and a woman, and it'll change the fonts, it'll change the size of the headlines, it'll change the color, the background. There might be 12 different variants. And what it does is every single person that comes gets a different variant. And over a period, a short period of time, they can figure out which combination of font or font styles of color and background and image that you can get 30 or 40 percent more uh, engagement on that one page by using multivariant testing. And in the way in the way it's set up, it's just each person that shows up is getting they're getting served up a different page, a different variant, and then they track that particular page to see how that person operates and did they, and then over a period of time, uh, they can dial that sucker in wow. and figure out the perfect 
combination of colors and fonts and images to get the most possible reaction. Who I does? Think it's pretty cool. That's amazing. Who does? Is that an application or a, a service yeah, company? Still out there, but that's going to be more high level. You, first of all, you got to have a lot of traffic. Okay. You like what? Like Jack will probably have enough traffic on his site to to you know to warrant that if he was really worried about whether he's going to sell something off his site. So we're, we're talking like thousands and thousands of views per day, probably. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. You got to have a lot of traffic to be, make that work your well, so that okay. work. When you back that back into those services are not cheap, uh, you know they're they're for the guy that's making a million and wants to turn into one point three million because he tweaked out his website with multivariate testing. Okay, well that that's something good to keep in mind. <laughs> something we yeah, can strive yeah. for. Well, let's let's back up. Let's like go to the thirty thousand foot view for a moment. Um, what you're you know what we're talking about here is. What's going to be full time income for you is the goal. What, why, why do we think, why is it important to kind of be your own boss? Why, why do this instead of the Come typical on, eight to five? Come on, man. You know, you know the answer to that. Everybody knows the answer to that because you don't want a freaking boss. Right. You know what to do, and when to show up, or how to dress, and when you can get off, and whether you can kneel down or not, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I want to be my own boss so I can sleep in if I want to. But, you know, being your own boss also means you have to have your own self, um, your own self, um, that's the word I'm looking for. You got to be disciplined, self-disciplined, because it's it's very easy to say, oh, well, now that I've quit my full-time job, I'm in business for myself. I can do as I want. Mm-hmm. And those people go out of business because they don't know what to do when nobody's telling them what to do. They don't realize, you know, you can't sit there and watch TV, you can't shuffle your cards or, or reorganize your desk every day. You gotta get out and do something that matters. And a lot of people, it's difficult, that's the most difficult thing is be, well, what should I be doing as a self-employed person? They just think it's just gonna happen. It does take a lot of hard work, but, uh, you know, I've never, I haven't been, I can't remember the last time I had a J-O-B where I worked with somebody. It's been so long, and, and, and I'm pretty sure I got fired from it because I can't, you know, it's very, I, I just don't have any, I don't have patience for somebody who thinks they can tell me what I should be, I don't know, I just, it, it bothers me. But I do like the, the freedom of being able to know that my efforts will determine how high or how fast I go, and then those rewards are, I'm able to call a shot, you know, I, I can be my own boss and have the freedom and be able to spend more time with my family. So some people, it's not about making a lot of money, it's about having more free time. If you can make the same amount of money you're making right now, and you only had to work 20 hours a week instead of 40, how many people would take that deal? Right. So that's a full, that's a full time income on part time hours, basically. Yeah. What you know? So you can leverage your time by getting a, a something that gives you more value and gives you more return on your on you know, your time investment, and you can make more money in a shorter period of time. And there's a lot of people that if they can do that, hey. Um, they don't. They don't need to work more hours and keep making more money. They just need to maintain that, so they got more free time to spend with their family or stay home with their kids instead of having to put your kids in daycare. Right. So you know. Yeah, it's, so it's it's not only. Yeah, you know, I'm totally on board with everything you, you're describing. Um, you know, the, from the you know you are your own boss, or you know you don't have a boss, kind of telling you what to do and when to show up and all that. I think also with all of that, you know, you and I um, offline and in person, we've had uh, discussions and people we look to talk about artificial intelligence, automation, all those changes that are happening and they're happening so quickly. Being kind of your own boss, I think it gives you, it gives us more flexibility to go with those changes that happen so quickly, you know, lately. With, with technology, with automation, with artificial intelligence, you know, the, things happen so quickly. We can adapt with them faster. I think that's another reason a lot of the a lot of us get into this. So, you know, like going back to the Amazon thing, um, you know, if Amazon gets some weird hair up their butt, 
um, you know, and they change up their algorithms or they shut down an account or whatever, you got to be able to adapt and go to, you know, selling, say, your items on Shopify, like you said. Like, it's, it's, a, it's about adapting. And I think that's another reason we get into this. Well, part of it, you got to be, be good with your money. When you start making a lot of money or you start making more money, you need to bank a bunch of it so you can ride out the tough times. Ride, I mean, it's not always going to be, uh, you know, raining gold on you. Right. But I will say that I believe that Amazon is probably the premier shot for most people to go change their life and totally revolutionize their finances and totally shoot up to another level. It's probably the best entrepreneurial entity experience um, opportunity that's ever come down the pike in my lifetime. I really yeah. believe that. Yeah. It's, it's, and even though with this, you know, with the fact that you got to worry about whether you know keep your nose clean, don't do anything intentionally wrong, and realize that yeah, you could that could happen. You know, there's nothing there's nothing to say you can't build multiple brands on on uh, Amazon. A lot of people do. They actually can open up multiple accounts. But don't go in and open up multiple accounts out of the gate. You have to get permission to open a second account, and you got to have a reason to do it. Well, my reason would be okay. I've got a line of. Um, bathroom products and I've got it branded and now I want to open up a line of swimming pool accessory products. That's a totally different brand and I want to run those two businesses separately because I'm going to sell one of them. So I build one from a personal income, I build the other one with the idea that when I get to a certain level, I can sell that business. And there are people selling their Amazon businesses every day for mega bucks. Oh, wow. And there's there are companies that are starting to do that now, but there's already been enough at maturity. I talked to a guy the other day, they sold a, one of the Amazon, one of the Amazon that they sold, they sold it for $4 million. Wow. I mean, it's got to be doing something by that time. <laughs> so, um, Quite a yeah. Bit. How are you going to... There's nothing better than being a business for yourself. I mean, there's so many advantages. You get to write off all your expenses, so when you buy a laptop that you're going to use, you're going to use it for your personal uh, consumption, but you're going to use it for your business. Your business buys it, you get to write it off, it reduces your taxable income. Especially if you, you know, I think we talked about this on one of your other um, uh, podcasts, especially if you have a W-2 income as an employee getting paid a regular wage from your boss, and you make forty thousand a year, or whatever, and you you spend maybe eight or ten thousand dollars on you know laptops and supplies and you know office supplies and pens and paper and stuff that you would use in, stuff you'd use at your personal property anyway. But now you can legitimately claim it as a business expense. Okay, that ten thousand dollars comes off your forty thousand. Now you only get taxed on thirty thousand dollars annual income while you're getting that business started. Now, maybe you don't make a lot of profit that first year, but that's okay. You get to write those expenses off. Uh, also, your mileage. I mean, it's like, what, 55 cents a mile or 50, I don't know what it is now, but you drive 100 miles and bam. You I know, mean, if I drive that conference, I drove to that conference. It was like 600 miles. Oh, you drove? That's like, cool. That's 1,200 miles round trip. So, what's 55 cents? percent of 1200 is like $600, a little over six. So, bam, $600. I basically got paid $600 to drive down there. <laughs> and I get 55 miles a gallon in my little VW Golf, so it only costs me two tanks of gas <laughs> to get down there back. Oh, wow. Two tanks of diesel. So I made money on that trip just for driving. Like, well, it should have been in Alaska, man. I think how much money I can make then. <laughs> <laughs> So, are you running your revenue? Can you say, are you running your revenue through an LLC or an S Corp or a? No, no. You can be a person. You can be a uh, sole provider. You don't have to do that. Okay. Uh, it would be a good business practice to open up a separate account where you do, you know, you're doing business as, mm -hmm. um, and run all your money through a separate account because it's going to be difficult if you're running it through your personal account because now you're, you're, you're co-mingling your personal money and your business money. As long as you have really good books, I guess you could do that. You need to have probably, you need to have probably an accountant to kind of help you deal with that. So you need to save every receipt. Uh, that you, every, anytime you spend money on anything, um, you know, cell phone bill, you get to write that, uh, write most of that off, depending on what you're, how you're using it. So you need to keep receipts of everything. 
And then you're going to look at, okay, how much income came in and how much expenses can I show? And and it's always kind of a double-edged sword. For self-employed people, it's hard to go out and buy a house because they always deduct as much as humanly possible, whatever's legal, to deduct, which reduces their taxable income, which makes them look like they're not making that much money. But a lot of that money just, you know, if you wanted to, you could lease a car and run it through your business. And if that Ferrari costs $500 a month lease, you can write that whole thing off in your business. Um, so there's lots of, you do need to talk to some experts about that to, to figure out what's the best way to leverage being in business and how to take advantage of the tax code. Because the tax code was built for business owners. I mean, the average person has a, 10, a 1040A, uh, that's real easy. But the people who make big money, that's where the tax code was built for all the loopholes. I, I was told by a guy at this conference, I don't know how true it is, because he, he's, he's an accountant for, he does accounting work for, um, for Amazon sellers, that's what he does. He said that if you form your own insurance company, that as an insurance company, the first $1.2 million of revenue that an insurance company uh, processes through their books is tax-free. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I've ever heard of that. I'm going to have to do some research to see. But he says, I swear, it's true. So if you buy a policy from your own insurance company and you can you know, charge them uh, – I don't, know how, I don't know how legal it is. All I know is that's what he claimed. I'm like, wow, I never heard of that. But I'm not super rich, and I know the super rich have, you know, they they put money on the offshore accounts. It's perfectly legal, and they buy yachts and figure out how to buy on their business, right? So, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good uh, good challenge to have getting to that level and and, and yeah. you know figuring out yeah. how to minimize your tax liability. I'm trying to look myself now for um, you know I was just watching uh, some YouTube videos of of you know you and I we always hear tax attorney CPA tax attorney CPA. I was watching some videos of a guy who's both a tax attorney and a CPA, and he was talking about setting up an S corporation. Um, and the revenue, all kinds of revenue, whether it's from one source or multiple sources, everything runs through the S corporation. And then from that, you set up a little bit of income from a W-2 and then everything else comes out of the S corporation in the form of, I guess it's a dividend. I forgot the term he used, but anyway, I'm, those are the kind of things I'm looking into myself to minimize both financial my financial liability, and then, um, you know, CYA. Well, there's a time and place for S-Corp. Or, What's that? Um, there's a time and place for an S-Corp or other corporations. Uh, I'm not sure if it's from the get-go, and I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's tougher to change over when you get down the road, but I do know there are some. If you got enough, high enough revenue, an S-Corp, you know, you can hire your kids and pay them a salary, and it works out that the first amount of money that you, you know, a certain amount of money that you pay them winds up being essentially tax-free. So if you can get them to do some of the work that you were going to do anyway, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, it, it benefits everybody. So there are some, definitely some advantages, but it seemed like to me you had to be doing a little bit before S-Corps really made a difference. I don't know. I can't make that claim. I just know that uh, there's a lot of different ways. You go LLCs and uh, yeah. S-Corps and C-Corps and well, I, I know the uh, limited liability company, it's a pass-through entity, so um, the way I understand it, that doesn't really minimize, um, the entity itself doesn't minimize the tax liability because the revenue just passes right through it. Um, and as corporation, I, I think it's different in terms of the revenue passing through and, and where it, how you slice it. But um, um, what was I going to... <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Must have been lying. No, I just think you're. We got so much information about this flowing around yeah. this topic. It's easy to get confused. What? It's just, I guess, the moral of that story is you got to do your research and you right. make sure you get enough different experts that you're that you're not getting different answers from everybody. Oh well, yeah. That's you know that jarred my memory. Um, one thing I do remember is I, I've heard from. You know, uh, not to beat this corporation thing to death, but um, I've heard from different people. Like some people say, like one CPA, I heard him say that uh, really, especially with like e-commerce type stuff, really like the thirty thousand dollar per year mark is 
is uh, about where an S corporation starts to make sense. Some of the older CPAs, you know, they might they might have a higher threshold or a higher number. But you know, he was saying he's a younger CPA. He was talking about thirty thousand, definitely forty thousand, is where an S corporation starts to make sense. But gotcha. um, okay. um, going, let's go back to because I think I think most people listening are probably going to be more like. How can I just get, you know, dip my toes in the water? How can I just start maybe trying to do a little side hustle more? Um, maybe we could go back to the garage sale topic. One thing that that, you know, I mentioned that therapist that I work with, he was talking about, you know, in terms of like starting out in garage sales and going to garage sales, his recommendation was become an expert in, in, a, in a handful of different type of items say for instance like i think he said like 10 or 12 was his recommendation but he was saying like hey if you want to be a mug guy like become an expert in in the mugs that are hot the mugs that are selling um you know really focus in on a, a smaller number of items instead of doing everything under the sun like say you want to do board games or plush toys he makes a ton of money on plush toys from thrift stores like he'll buy them for 99 cents or two bucks and they'll sell for like 20 30 bucks and it just blows right. my mind but he's focusing on that you have to be an expert something whether it's stethoscopes or yeah. some other item or board games um i will tell you that i know that there's some people at this conference i talked to that have teams of people that they train to go to yard sales for them and they each have oh, wow, specific really? items they look for. They know what range to pay, and and if they're not sure, they take a photograph and send it to to the to the guy that runs the, the business. And so if it's you, you, you know, they send you. I'm, I'm at a yard sale. Um, what do you think about this item for seven dollars? He looks like, oh yeah, snag that for sure. Or no, that's not that's not an authentic um, version of what we're looking for. Don't buy it. But. Um, if you want me to, I've got a link to. I think there's a course. I think they offer a course on um, how to shop. You know, how to run yards. How to do arbitrage through yard sales. Oh yeah. Because that's something almost nobody really wants to do. It seems so clunky. It doesn't seem like it would make sense to do that. But they make their biggest margins on yard sales. I was gonna say, so, my gut is that you can probably find you could probably find the better margins from yard sales. You know, yeah, compared to yeah, because you're, you're finding deals that are like low, you know, two, three, four, five dollars, and they might be a hundred or two hundred dollar item, right? For sure. Oh, that's definitely um, thrift stores or garage sales are definitely where, you know, just my one friend who you know I watch him and see all the money he makes doing that, but that seems like where he's got the better margins, uh, and he and he's talked about um, he focuses on items that sell for over ten dollars now like for some reason i guess you know the well, time I'll tell you what, on, on, on amazon i think the sweet spot is like 12 bucks okay but if you have an item that you can't sell it for at least 12 bucks or more because uh first of all fba is going to charge you a flat four dollars per item no matter what you pay for it so if you pay if you sell it for six dollars and you're going to pay them four dollars you're going to lose so their four dollars comes out and then there's variable fees based on the weight and how long it's been on the shelf, storage fees, and uh, some other things. So that usually adds up to about 30%. That's where that 30% figure comes in. Okay. But that's a higher percentage if you're less than 12, because if you got an $8 item and you're going to pay $4 to FBA fees and then some other fees on top of it, you're over 50% right off the bat. Okay. So you have to sell something about you know, twelve dollars in order for you to be able to pay F, uh, Amazon's fees and, and pay your cost to get it, and still make any money. So okay. that's kind of the rule of thumb. So kind of like twelve dollars is kind of the rule of thumb for where the the percentages start to hold true. Where you're gonna make it, yeah. Where you're gonna break good. even, make some money. Okay, that's good enough. And I talk also based on the cost of the unit. We're just saying that there's not almost no way to make money if you pay. You know, less than if you if you're selling it for less than twelve, it's tough. Okay. Another thing, I I don't know which platform it's on. I want to say eBay, but uh, another example that maybe the audience can use is uh, my colleague. What he does, 
either he will get an item, let's say a blender, and it'll either be a used item, a new item, or sometimes he's gotten pallet purchases where he'll pay like, I don't know, $100 for this pallet of stuff. And sometimes items in there are broken. But what the interesting thing is that he's talking about lately is he'll get that blender and he will make more money selling different parts of the blender than for the entire blender itself. So maybe he, he, he takes the carafe, you know, someone maybe wants a replacement carafe or someone maybe needs a replacement, yeah. you know, seal or, you know, blade or whatever. I thought about that. That's interesting. Yeah. So he kind of will break up items, uh, you know, sort of take a, and sell the different pieces, the different components. And he makes more money doing that. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so say you, you know, say you bought a pallet of goodies and some of the stuff was broken. It might not be a complete loss because you might still be able to sell, you know, components of the broken item. That was, that was kind of interesting thing to me that, you know, I learned lately. Yeah, I thought about that. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. There's so many different ways to do things like that. I mean, I know a guy that made a lot of money just selling suckers, hard candy suckers, but he had all kind of different, um, you know, flavors. He had like pickle flavored suckers mm -hmm. and, um, you know, peanut butter flavored suckers and all kind of stuff like that. But he had such a variety. People loved it, you know, jalapeno flavored uh, suckers. <laughs> So, yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do, man. It's just your imagination, it, and I ain't thought about that. that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I didn't think about it either. It was it was uh, pretty fascinating. It, it amazes me what people will, you know, pay for, like do a value-for-value value exchange. Um, you know, when I first started watching, you know, my colleague doing this, I thought, what? Nobody's going to buy that. And, you know, he would sell all these items on eBay and make, you know, really good margins. Um, and, uh, you know, it started, I feel like it started stretching my imagination. And then I stopped to myself, you know, I thought to myself, well, look at the stuff that you've bought online that other people would go, why the hell would you buy that? You know what I mean? I've bought, uh, bought, I've bought um, hissing cockroaches on eBay before. Uh, you know, like, that's such an odd, weird thing that I think it just goes to show that, you know, don't be afraid. People are buying all kinds of stuff. Don't be afraid. Get started. Just get your, you know, get your feet wet. Try it. Get out and try it. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've bought, I uh, bought, uh, you know, hissing cockroaches on, on eBay before I bought, um, you know, like little golf ball trinkets and stuff like that. Like people are buying stuff. People, <laughs> people are looking for the, the things that you might not think they will. So just get out and do There's it. There's all kind of weird stuff, man. Yeah. People selling live worms for bait. Um, I've seen people selling poop. What? Actual manure. For like, uh, uh, pot and for gardening, man. Like, that and dirt. Somebody else is selling bags of soil. I'm like, really? There wasn't. There wasn't like some super <laughs> duper premium, you know, scientific tested soil. It's just like soil. dirt. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's crazy. I can't imagine that that would be a good return on the your time investment. Just selling dirt. Um, <laughs> I, I've got an old acquaintance from back in the day. He sells potting soil combined with biochar, like a, a charcoal. Um, yeah, biochar is the eighth wonder of the world. Yeah, and and so they sell big uh, big bags of that online for like 60, 70 bucks. So that, that might make sense, but I don't know about just plain old dirt. <laughs> so where, you know, we, we've kind of like hit a bunch of different things. We've talked about different apps. You know, you've walked us through a little bit about retail arbitrage, online arbitrage some of the percentages, um, kind of where you're heading. Um, so this is just a taste. Where can people tune in and keep up with all your efforts? Um, you know, you've got this, your webinar, your back up and running webinars coming up. Uh, where can people find out more? Well, I can probably send you a link to one of my past webinars where I've interviewed someone. Okay. And, and 
you can probably put that in the show notes. And by clicking on that link, even though it's a past webinar, it's still going to ask for their name and their email, which will add them to my email list. So when I go do a new one, they would automatically get notified. Okay. And they get to check out one of the you know webinars that I've done in the past. They could do that. Okay. I also belong to um, a company that has all these different courses that you can take. They're all, you know, affiliate style courses. Where, but it's, this is the group of people who went down and met in Atlanta, and these guys um, they have some good courses. One of them is proven Amazon course. If you want to know how to sell on Amazon, and I think it's a couple two or three hundred dollars. I'm not I'm sure the exact price on it, but it's worth every penny of it. It's a good way to learn, and then you automatically get dumped into the Facebook group with us, where you can ask any question on the sun, and there, and there are it's a very active Facebook group. It's a private group, and any any question you can ask about how to do something, somebody knows how to do it and can give you an answer really quickly. I use it all the time that way. Okay. I can give you a link to that if somebody if they're interested. I am affiliate, so if they were to purchase, they won't come out of their pocket, but they would compensate me for promoting it. Okay, I'd be absolutely. But, uh, yeah. Those are two places. The my webinars are free. If they can figure out how to get to my YouTube channel, and keep in mind my YouTube channel is kind of convoluted. It's not branded as a business. It's just me. But all my interviews are up there that I've done in the past. But also, you know, my video of you know building a uh, a lean to bar <laughs> um, <laughs> shed or or my beekeeping videos or how to put together an IKEA kitchen cabinet. Uh, they're on there too. So there's a bunch of crap on there that has nothing to do with e commerce. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about revamping and, and re building a, a brand new YouTube channel that is more, you know, e-commerce directed towards a brand versus a bunch of uh, personal stuff. But you can find my YouTube channel, it's just my name, Jake Robinson. Uh, I know there's other Jake Robinsons out there. If you can get to it, you can, there's a ton of great interviews. It's like a front row seat to some of the best teachers in the industry. Awesome. And maybe um, we'll, we'll, so we will put a link in the show notes. Um, maybe we could find a good starting point video. Maybe we could kind of cruise back through your your collection here and find a good starting video or, or start maybe, maybe a couple of them or so. Well, I'll tell you what, I've got a link to a webinar, I mean, uh, a podcast this guy does. The guy that runs this group, he does a podcast. He's got about 80-something episodes right now. Okay. That will blow you away. That's a good place to start. It's free information, doesn't cost anything. What's the name and of the uh, the gentleman? It's Jim uh, Cochran. And okay. Uh, okay. I've got a link somewhere here to send you over to the um podcast so I'll, I'll send that to you and uh, you can put that in your show notes too yeah Jim Coffin I don't cool. know the exact address of it right this second okay here it is right here alright so yeah. if you give me a few minutes I'll send you all these links yeah. over and you can do what you want with them we're always uh, always entertaining always eye opening um, you know, once, uh, you know, maybe we could follow up in a little while, like, you know, a handful of months or something and, sure. and see how it is, uh, back up and running and whatnot. But, yeah. uh, maybe I'll see you on the, uh, webinars, man, cause it's a live webinar. You can come in there and ask any questions you have. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I might bring you in, the, you know, I can, I can actually, with the technology that I use, if you're in the webinar, I say, Hey, I got a good friend in here. I'm going to bring Maddox into the room. Yeah. He, he's got a question he wants to ask the guest. I can bring you in live. Oh. You're one, you're on the panel with us now. Oh, that's cool. You ask your questions, have a, a conversation, and I can kick you back out. Well, I will, uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, mark my calendar. Um, for that October uh, relaunch sort of thing. Um, any other final tips or suggestions to leave the audience? Any any final thoughts? Yeah, I will say this: don't get uh, don't uh, don't overanalyze it. Uh, when you start figuring out something, and it's something that you said, oh, okay, I can actually go do that. I can actually go to the store and find something. I, I, I can get an Amazon app on my phone; it's free. Mm -hmm. I can at least check and see. Start. Uh, scanning items and see what the price difference are is take action because that's the biggest thing I see people take courses and they belong to groups and they read 
information, but they never take a, you know, actually pull the trigger. And that kills people's dreams and ambitions bigger than anything else out there. Take action. Take awesome. action, man. Awesome. If you, even if it's wrong, you'll learn more than, uh, you just do it. Awesome. And you'll be glad you did, so. Well, thanks for, uh, Thanks for getting us up to speed, Jake. We appreciate it. All right, brother. Appreciate right. you having me on. Thanks for the opportunity. appropriate now with the recent events in Las Vegas to share something that you know it might fit it might be appropriate it might be useful but when I was on clinical rotations or getting ready to go on clinical rotations actually I asked one gentleman who was kind of a mentor to me at that time um, you know I was asking for tips on clinical rotations his name is Jeff Ling uh, he's an MD, PhD, he uh, neurointensive care surgeon, uh, retired a colonel in the army. And he, I mean, he worked at the White House. Um, he was director at DARPA. He started a new uh, directorate there. So he's, he's kind of a bad mamma jamma. And I asked him for a tip and he said, make them laugh. And he was talking about, again, clinical rotations, but he said, you know, make people laugh, make them laugh. And I think there's a lot of power in that. And the example he gave is a, a, a handful of years back, there was a, a lady, I think Congresswoman who along with other people were shot was shot. And, um, I can't remember what state was it Gifford, but, right? Somewhere in maybe Arizona yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think that mm -hmm. I, I was going to say as a lady somewhere around Nevada or something like that. Um, but uh, there were quite a few people shot and everybody's rolling into the trauma bay and people at the, you know, whatever level one trauma center will run around, you know, kind of like chickens with their head cut off. It was kind of crazy. And this one trauma surgeon, I won't, I won't say his name because I don't have permission, but he walked in and he kind of surveyed the scene, all this craziness going on. And he says, man, this is kind of like Baghdad, except here we have AC. And it like that's a little bit of, funny. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's you know that little bit of humor kind of you know jarred people back to, hey, we got a job to do, and 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 he gave that story, and he also made the point that especially in healthcare, but I think this applies everywhere. You know things are challenging. I I I you know the guys Pat and uh, Captain Jack report recorded an episode uh, yesterday that I wasn't involved in because I had my own uber challenging stuff going on. We all have challenges. And the point that Dr. Ling made is that with those challenges, humor can function kind of like a release valve. Like it, like it just, it just lets off some of that pressure. So big tip that he gave was, was make them laugh, you know, and granted there's probably an art to it, you know, appropriate time and inappropriate time to, you know, insert humor. But in these really tense high stakes situations, sometimes it can be appropriate. Sometimes it can be appropriate if you're having a challenging day. Just, you know, tell some jokes, uh, maybe watch some YouTube clips or or try to reframe whatever challenging thing you're going through and 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 gather some humor from it to make you laugh. And that again serves as kind of like a release valve. Yeah, I gotta that's, tell that's you, man, it. some of the funniest fucking jokes I have ever heard in my life were while me and yeah. my buddies were standing over dead bodies. Yeah. It, and yeah. and I like I want to believe that it's not because of the dead body, but I think that it I think somehow it is. <laughs> it is. I think it is. It's you know, it's like in emergency medicine, you know, some folks if they 
were to, you know, kind of listen in like a fly on a wall, yeah. they might be like, man, that is completely inappropriate time to be, you know, hamming it up. But there's a purpose it, to it, it. Yeah, it does. It, it helps us kind of release some of that pressure of, man, we just worked 20 minutes to try to revive this gentleman and he's dead. And we got to kind of relieve that pressure to go on to the next patient and give that next patient our 100 percent. So make them laugh. Make yourself laugh. That's our suggestion. Boom. Second ending of the show. See you next time, folks.